What I'm going to be talking about is something different from, uh, um, uh, you know, what what I what what has been the topic through the morning, through the morning or the my morning and your afternoon, evening, um, to talk about a new syndrome, a new syndrome of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which we discovered and described for the first time in 2004. And what I want to mention right straight away is that the frequency of hypogonadism in the male type 2 diabetic is 33% at any time that you measure it. So you don't have to wait for it to develop. It is there. And therefore, it is as frequent as hypertension, as frequent as hypercholesterolemia. So you've got to look into the testosterone status of all type 2 diabetics. Now, the other point that I just want to mention, and I shall show you as we go through the slides, is that neither HbA1c nor the duration of diabetes was related to uh, hypogonadism. It was only BMI. So we then investigated the issue of obesity and found that 20%, 25% of non-diabetic obese are hypogonadal as well. So if you put that term of di diabetes and obesity together, diabetes, it is the commonest cause of male hypogonadal state. So now, let me come back to how we discovered this syndrome. In 1997, two years after I started my center here in Buffalo, came Viagra, sildenafil. And in the New England Journal of Medicine paper that was published on sildenafil by Pfizer, 70 to 75% responded, responded positively to their defects in erectile dysfunction. But... In the JAMA paper that followed on diabetics with erectile dysfunction, the next thing you had notice a the syndrome was the fact a prevalence that the of testosterone only were neither related to the duration of diabetes nor to HbA1c levels. The major correlation was with that with, with was with that with BMI. And I don't know. There's the a problem. Mahima, now why is this echo coming? Is there a lag? And this, you, you guys are recording my sound, so are you replaying it immediately? <laughs> no, Mahima, what's wrong? Mahima, just check. It was not there earlier. Just check it. Yeah, just just go back to the first slide, please. I think now just it is go okay. Back. Just go back to the first. Yeah, that's it. Leave it there now. It's okay now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go back. Yeah, leave it here. Okay. So, as I was saying, that the reason, the way we discovered this was because a whole lot of diabetics who went to urologists who were prescribing sildenafil left, right, and center for erectile dysfunction, following the initial New England Journal of Medicine paper in non-diabetics, they found a whole lot of non-responders amongst the diabetics. And these patients were referred to me, fortunately, to look at what was wrong. And being a systematic uh, endocrinologist, I measured their testosterone levels, I measured their prolactin levels, and looked at any other possibility that might be responsible for this non-response. It turned out that testosterone was low, both total and free were low in 33% of these patients. So that's how the syndrome was discovered. And the first paper appeared in Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2004. And you can see the data here, the differences in total and free testosterone between controls, eugonadals, and the hypogonadals. Now, the other interesting thing that happened was that LH and FSH were not elevated in spite of the low testosterone. So clearly, it was not a primary testicular defect. It was a hypothalamic, hypophysial testicular defect. So clearly, it was a case of secondary hypogonadism, and therefore, we've given it to the name hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. 
Next slide. And here you can see the beautiful inverse correlation with body weight and testosterone concentrations. The higher the body weight, the lower the testosterone concentrations. Next. And here, then we did another study just to see whether type 1s also had that syndrome. And these were younger patients with type 1 and comparable age type 2s. And you can see it's only in the type o, type 2 diabetics that you have the hypogonadal state. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, uh, go back. Go back. Yeah. And here is the study published in 2010 where we showed that the uh, obese without diabetes had uh, hypogonadal state on the left. And on the right, if you had diabetes in addition, you had an increase in the, the frequency of uh, hypogonadism. So 25% roughly versus 33%. One-fourth versus one-third. Next slide. Next slide, please. And here, we then went to ask the question whether younger obese males also had this problem. And this was the first study published in the obese children between the ages of 14 and 20 years. And you can see the differences in the total and the free testosterone, significantly lower levels in the obese children. So remember this, that the syndrome is right across the ages. Now, this is an interesting cartoon, which was published a year before we published our paper in 2004. So we downloaded it from the internet, and you can see here the beautiful male uh, form of Michelangelo, of David by Michelangelo, standing in the Uffizi Gallery in, uh, in Florence. And if you go to Florence, you must visit that gallery because it has amazing works of Renaissance artists, and Michelangelo is one of them. And then the cartoonist, in view of the obesity levels in the United States, just made this cartoon. Just go back, go back, go back, go back, go back. Please go back. Please go back. And you can see that on the right, after David had been to a, a, a trip to United States for a few years, how his format changed. And you can see the tummy coming out. You can see the breasts coming out with extra fat. And you can see the deltoids melting away. And you can see the pectorals also melting away. And you can see obesity even in the thigh and in the legs. But what is most important in this one is his genitals. You can see his genitals have, have shrunk, almost disappeared. So this, this uh, cartoonist obviously knew of the syndrome in obesity before we published it. So I just want you to remember this because this image will stick in your mind and will remind you every time you see an obese patient and you've been talking about obesity all evening, please remember this, that hypogonadism is a part of being obese. Next slide. And here, the next question was, why does this syndrome occur? What is it in the obese that causes them to, all the diabetics, which causes them to have a low testosterone? And during one of my trips to the Middle East, actually in Dubai, I was giving a talk on this syndrome, and somebody got up and asked me uh, as to why this occurs. And he said it could be due to increased obesity and the adip adipose tissue generating more aromatase, which, con which is the enzyme that converts uh, uh, testosterone to estradiol. That may be responsible. So we came back home and, and did work on that, and I'll show you the data on that in a while. But in fact, that did not turn out to be the answer. The answer lay in this paper in mice who had had a knockout of their insulin receptor in the, you know, general knockout of the insulin receptor and, and in, in, in the brain, in the brain. And uh, as a result, these 
mice developed hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. As you can see, the histology of the, please go back, please go back, don't harass, please go back, yeah. So you can see the, the, the seminiferous tubules shrunken on the right panel and the, and the uh, seminiferous tubules perfectly normal in the left panel because of the knockout of the insulin receptor in the brain. So clearly, the whole syndrome starts in the brain. Next slide. And here is the next issue that we knew, and this is from our own work that we described for the first time, that in obesity and in type 2 diabetes, you have increased levels of inflammation and increased CRP. And here, again, in the hypogonadals, you had a high CRP. So that may have contributed to the uh, insulin resistance in the brain. Next slide. Now, the next thing is to look into what is happening in the adipose tissue in these hypogonadal patients. And this is a very important part of my talk. So please pay attention. Although it is molecular biology, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So if you take fat biopsies from these uh, type 2 diabetics with hypogonadism, you find that at four levels of insulin signal transduction, there are deficits in the mediators. So insulin receptor beta subunit, insulin receptor substrate number one, AKT2, which is an enzyme, and GLUT4. GLUT4 is the molecule that carries glucose into the cell from the surface once it's stimulated by insulin. So at all four levels of insulin signal transduction, there was a defect. Keep this in mind because we'll come back to this in a, in a couple of minutes. Next slide. And here, another very important mediator, which is the AMP kinase alpha, also diminished both in adipose tissue and in the muscle. And what is important about this? AMP kinase is the one that mediates glucose uptake under the influence of metformin and exercise. So you were talking about exercise, lifestyle, and metformin a few minutes ago. So AMP kinase is the key enzyme that mediates the transport of glucose under the influence of exercise and metformin. Next slide. And that was diminished in these patients too. So now we come on to treating these patients. So we had these patients and we had a large NIH grant to investigate the effect of testosterone in these patients over a period of six months. So this is what we did. So when we gave them testosterone over a period of six months, the, the patients who got the testosterone, you can see, had steadily higher levels of testosterone, whereas those who did not stayed at the bottom and did not change. Next slide. And with it, there was a uh, change in weight in the testosterone group. A1C had come down slightly in the testosterone group, but not, not, no, did not change significantly. I'm sorry. A1C did not change significantly in the testosterone group here. HDL cholesterol, no change. LDL cholesterol, slight but insignificant fall. No other significant change. Next slide. And here is the key element in terms of body composition. So here you see that although the overall body weight did not change, total lean mass increased significantly in the testosterone arm from 70 to 73 kilograms. Total fat mass on the other side diminished. So this is a very important thing to remember when you're talking about adiposity as you were earlier on in the various talks, remember that hypogonadism will lead to further adiposity and administration of testosterone will lead to a loss of fat. And this loss of fat is in the visceral and in the hepatic level. Next slide. And with it, we showed 
that there was an improvement in insulin sensitivity. So glucose infusion rates under hyperinsulinemic clamps showed an increase, and therefore, clearly, insulin is uh, testosterone is clearly an insulin sensitizer. Keep that in mind as well. So all of these interesting properties of testosterone emerged out of our studies over the last decade. Next slide. And then, I've shown you, I've already told you that testosterone increases insulin sensitivity. And then free fatty acids, which inhibit the action of insulin, fell. And leptin concentrations fell because adipose tissue fell. Next slide. And with it, the you remember the false signaling points that I mentioned to you in, in insulin signal transduction? All of those four elements increased with testosterone. So clearly, testosterone at a cellular and molecular level and at a ghost level is an insulin sensitizer, causes a fall in adiposity and an increase in muscle mass. Next slide. And here, AMP kinase also showed an increase. So the other element of glucose uptake was also improved by testosterone. Next slide. And then, in addition, we were able to show that testosterone is also anti-inflammatory. So you can see on the left, three pro-inflammatory elements, SOX3, which inhibits insulin, um, insulin action, IKK beta, which also inhibits insulin action, P10, also inhibits insulin action, was suppressed. And then on the right, you see CRP levels fell, and TNF-alpha, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, also fell. Next slide. And then the other interesting thing was that we had thought that with the hypogonadal state, perhaps there would be a compensatory increase in the expression of the androgen receptor. But in fact, it was the other way around. In fact, these patients have a double, ham double whammy. On the one hand, testosterone falls. On the other, testosterone receptor, androgen receptor also falls. With it, there is a fall in estrogen receptor and there is a fall in aromatase. And following, as you can see on the right panel, the following testosterone administration, they all reverse mathematically. Next slide. And here, again, we looked at, those were the expressions of androgen receptor, etc. in the fat cell, even in the circulating mononuclear cells, you see similar changes. Next slide. And again, diminished androgen receptor in the muscle tissue of these people and reversal with testosterone. Next slide. And then the important part, and these two also are original discoveries because these elements were not associated with muscle growth before. So fibroblast growth factor, two, increased with testosterone, and in parallel, IGF-1, which has been associated with muscle growth previously, also increased. Next slide. Next slide, please. And then you see, you see here FGF2 expression in, at the mRNA level in the muscle also increased with testosterone therapy. FGR, the receptor to FGF2 also increased with, test, with testosterone therapy. And then the factor that suppresses muscle growth called myostatin was suppressed and another element called MRF4, which is also suppressive of muscle growth, was also suppressed. So clearly, a very comprehensive action of testosterone at various levels to promote muscle growth that you saw in growth terms, gross terms earlier on. Next slide. And then we come to the other issue. As you know, in the hypogonadal people, hemoglobin levels fall. They get anemia. And so we investigated that. And here we show 
very nicely that with testosterone tre- treatment, erythropoietin levels increase, and the expression of something called hepcidin, or the pr- concentration of something called hepcidin falls. And hepcidin is the protein that inhibits the, the, the release of iron from cells, uh, which is done through a molecule called ferroportin, and ferroportin is inhibited from transporting uh, iron from inside the cell to outside. So although you may not have overall iron deficiency, in functional terms, you do get iron deficiency because the iron that is circulating within the body from dead red cells and into the macrophages cannot be released and cannot be made available. Next slide. Now, having shown you all these effects of testosterone from our study, I next go on to a very interesting study which we carried out with uh, uh, Dr. Farid Saad, who's um, actually working with Bayer, who are producers of testosterone, but he has, got, he has set up a center, a very nice center near Hamburg, uh, working with uh, uh, two doctors, father and son, Heider and Heider urologists. And these data, just pay attention here now. So these are the longest treated patients with testosterone up to 11 years with a mean of eight years. And what you see here is the change in total testosterone, of course, if you give testosterone, testosterone will increase as I've shown you previously. So that happens. Next slide. And with it, look at this weight change. Steady weight change in the testosterone group versus a steady but slower weight gain in the non-treated group. So in this study, they had patients who were given testosterone and those patients who refused testosterone. And so they've served as controls and that's what happened. And then with it, you can see now here, HOMA IR is an index, a, a, a crude index, but it works. HOMA IR as an index of insulin resistance. And you can see that in the testosterone treated patients, the HOMA IR steadily falls through this period of 11 years, whereas the HOMA IR steadily increases in the group not treated. So clearly another very beautiful piece of evidence that testosterone is an insulin sensitizer. Next slide. And here you see A1C. A1C steadily falls in the diabetics given testosterone, whereas it steadily rises in those not given testosterone over a period of 11 years. Next year, next slide. And if you then analyze the data at the end of the, the treatment period, what you find is that 91% of these patients who were not given any additional anti-diabetic drugs got their A1C less than 7%. 83% got an A1C less than 6.5%, and 34% of the patients got total remission. They did not need any drugs at all. This is remarkable. Obviously, this study will have to be reproduced elsewhere because this is really sounds like science fiction that you can actually cause a remission of hypogonadal diabetic patients with the administration of testosterone, but it's true. Next slide. And with it, you see survival curve, Kaplan marker for survival. And you can see the rate of uh, mortality in the non-treated group in red is down to around 60% or less at 11 years, whereas it is around 80% or more and in the treated group. And within that, if you analyze the cause of death, which is significantly greater in the, the control group, you see that it is due to myocardial infarction, stroke, myocardial infarction and stroke. And of course, the diabetic complications are also higher in the untreated patients. So clearly, testosterone has a very important role in terms of treatment in type 2 diabetes 
and therefore it must be measured in every patient that you see with type 2 diabetes. Next slide. And here is a study on, um, uh, on uh, uh, pre-diabetics, and you can see that uh, in, the, in the testosterone-treated group, pre-diabetes remits within a few years, within eight years. Next slide. Now, the latest study in this, well, one of the latest studies in this group is on bariatric surgery in adolescence. So this uh, study uh, called the Teen Lab Study, Teen for Teens, Teen, they were 14 to 20 years old, and, uh, and these patients were subjected to bariatric surgery, so they lost weight. So let's see what happened to them over a period of five years. Next slide. You can see weight fell and uh, then flattened out at around 20 months or you know, 10 to 20 months it flattened and steadily continued that way. Testosterone levels steadily increased with weight loss. So clearly, obesity is the enemy of testosterone, just as testosterone is the enemy of obesity, as I showed you. So here is testosterone peaking at 24 months, and then some steady fall. Sex hormone binding globulin increases after, because as you know, sex hormone binding globulin is low in insulin-resistant patients, so it increases following weight loss and increase in insulin sensitivity. Next slide. And free testosterone also increased, peaking at 24 months. Next slide. And you can see that the increase in testosterone is directly related to change in body weight. Next slide. And here is a very interesting slide where we show the reversal of the increase in testosterone in those who got weight, weight regain. So you can see in uh, yellow, the patients who maintain their weight loss to the end. In red, uh, you see the patients that regained. And those that regained, you can see in the blue line, also had a fall in testosterone again. So you can't really have a better evidence of the relationship of weight, weight body weight with, with testosterone. So you start off with obesity, you start off with low testosterone, you reverse obesity, you increase your testosterone, you regain weight, you lose your testosterone again. Next slide. So having shown you this, I just want to show you two or three final slides. And these are very interesting as well. So this was a study done by Vitter et al., um, who is based in uh, Adelaide in Australia. This is an Australian study where they looked at the effect of lifestyle plus uh, versus lifestyle plus testosterone in patients with sort of early type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. And let's see what they found. Now, why I'm sort of emphasizing this study a little is because the threshold at which they started treating with testosterone were not in the hypogonadal range. They were in the low normal range. And this is the first study ever to be done in the low, low normal range testosterone people where significant metabolic changes were seen again. Next slide. And here you can see that in these patients with early diabetes, after uh, two years of treatment, you had only 12% who remained with diabetes versus 21% who remained with diabetes with lifestyle alone. Next slide. And blood glucose concentrations, fasting ones, fell by 1.7 millimoles per liter in the testosterone arm and only by less than one millimole per liter uh, in, in the placebo arm. Next slide. 
And here is the group with uh, pre-diabetes. And again, pre-diabetes uh, was reversed, uh, occurred, you know, stayed only in, in 31, 32% of the testosterone arm and 45% of the placebo arm. So clearly, testosterone is a profound metabolic effect. Next slides. And this sort of brings me to the end of the slideshow. But let me conclude then. Number one, that type 2 diabetes is associated with male hypogonadism with the testosterone levels being low in 33%. Obesity is associated with hypogonadism, with testosterone levels being low in 25%. These observations have profound metabolic effects. And the major one, I've shown you a whole, I've shown you a whole series of metabolic effects, but the major one is that of insulin sensitization. So if you have obesity and male hypogonadal state, you will be insulin resistant and you will progress to diabetes. And similarly, as I've shown you through the data done with the Farid Saad, that over a long period of time, you might even reverse diabetes when you treat with testosterone. So the main take home message here is, please, please measure testosterone in every type two diabetic patient and in every obese patient, because you will be rewarded with gratitude from your patients. Thank you very much.